Do you think that was a directive to me that they've got it solved? Yeah. All right. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Mike Jabara. I'm with MQA. And MQA is a British audio technology company. Today, we're really grateful to have three fantastic panelists here to speak based on their perspectives of the live streaming opportunity in front of us. In just a moment, I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves as well as to describe a little bit about how their company fits into the live streaming ecosystem. Before I do, I just wanted to give you an expectation as viewers and listeners of what our conversation will be today. You may have participated in conversations and panel sessions where live streaming is explored. Um, today, we're gonna really focus on our collective belief that live streaming is here to stay. And we're talking about some of the work yet to be done, some of the success stories and the experiences that you can expect moving forward. So with that, let's start with some introductions. And Claire, if you don't mind, I'm gonna to turn to you first. Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Mass. I'm the CEO of Drift. Um, Drift is a new company born out of lockdown, uh, actually born from ATC management and independent management, management company. And um, obviously out of the need that arise due to the pandemic, we reacted quite quickly and created a company that produces, promotes and markets uh, live stream. So it kind of does a full service end to end, works very collaboratively, collaboratively with artists to create a format that we think is compelling enough to convert into ticketed uh, ticketing purchases. Um, we've done some uh, pretty famous live stream, including Nick Cave, Nal Horan, Andrea Bocelli, and our very first Laura Marling show, uh, and many more over the last nine months. Fantastic, thank you. Julian, you next, if you don't mind. Of course, hi everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Julian Mittelberg, I'm the co-founder of Benzin Town. And Benzin Town, um, uh, is a company that has been focused for many years in connecting uh, artists and fans around live music. Uh, um, best known for its application that noti notify you when the band is coming in town. We have now 60, over 60 million you know, uh, registered users, about half a million artists using our platform. Last year, uh, we had to pivot uh, with the COVID uh, in March, in uh, actually April 2020, we decided to switch from uh, uh, live events to live stream uh, event and build a destination where artists could promote the live stream shows and fans can discover live stream. Um, fast forward today, we have um, promoted around 80,000 live streams since uh, last year from about 20,000 uh, um, artists. Uh, and at any given time, I think now on the platform, you can find over 3,000 shows that are being streamed or announced to be streamed uh, shortly. And we, uh, we've, I think uh, we shared recently a number of stats about, you know, how artists are performing their show and how fans are actually consuming the shows. Also, uh, a few months ago, we launched a new service called Benzin Town Plus, uh, which basically had uh, came up with the idea of offering uh, about 20 shows a month uh, for a subscription around 10 bucks uh, per month to uh, to fans uh, with a different taste. Well, this is something that we've been testing for the past four months. Thank you for that. Tim. Yeah, my name is Tim Westergren. Nice to be here. Um, I'm the co-founder of a company called Sessions Live. I've been at this for a while. I was a former founder and CEO of Pandora some time ago um, and a, a longtime musician myself. Uh, Sessions Live is a live streaming service that in many ways looks like a lot of other services out there. It allows artists to play live shows and interact with a virtual audience. The two things that make Sessions a little unique are, one, this product was born very much of the gaming world. So it's really built on top of a foundation of the most advanced techniques for, for virtual games, um, particularly developing virtual economies. My co-founders are long, long-standing developers of virtual games. And the second piece is we have a, what we call a growth engine, which is a very effective way for us to acquire audiences. So I think we are alone in actually spending our own money uh, marketing every show, um, which we do. About 2,500 artists play every week, and that number is growing very rapidly. And I think we have, a, and, and this ranges from artists that nobody's heard of from all sorts of places in the world. We're in 250 countries and 18 languages through to, you know, more 
well-known artists like uh, Bare Naked Ladies, Hank Williams Jr. We just uh, announced his Act Brown band uh, uh, agreement. So it's just starting to grow. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, and this is exciting for me individually because MQA um, as a technology is really an ingredient inside of live experiences and recorded. Some of you may be familiar with MQA because of work we've done in recorded music streaming. Um, but in March of 2018 at South by, we had launched MQA's live technology, which would allow, um, and of course, none of us anticipated the lockdown that we've lived through, but it would allow promoters to reach live music fans outside of the venue who for whatever reason wouldn't be able to attend, which now seems to be a very relevant topic as we're all thinking about new models. Um, thanks everybody for the introduction in the background. Julian, if you don't mind, I'm gonna come back to you because it might be helpful to start talking a little bit more about the data that you published recently. Maybe give us a baseline of the current perception of live streaming, consumer adoption. There are a number of research efforts out there saying maybe the consumer hasn't quite figured it out yet, but what does your data suggest that you've published? Well, so uh, as I said earlier, we, uh, we really um, pivoted uh, the usage of the platform from, you know, being notified for a live show to being notified for a live streaming show. And uh, that allows to have an idea of consumption as well as, you know, uh, on a regular basis to surveys and ask our users, you know, what has been their, their feedback on consuming that new uh, format. Uh, uh, keep in mind that our users are people that used to go to live shows. So this is a population of concert goers, uh, you know, and that, that's really the data that, you know, we, uh, where did that come from? Uh, what's interesting is that most of those users have been, well, actually have uh, uh, consumed a live uh, streaming show over the past 12 months. At minimum of one, but a lot of them several polls. Uh, half of them have actually paid uh, to watch uh, uh, a stream show, which is very encouraging. Uh, the question, of course, not for today will be, will they continue? But when we ask them if this is something uh they were satisfied with and they plan to continue consuming this yes for the most part so we are uh quite encouraged by the fact that we, you know um this new uh, media uh, may be here to last and uh as tim was mentioning earlier uh, will be a way for artists to continue to make uh, extra money besides you know resuming uh, touring and, and selling uh, selling albums Julian, you just raised an interesting point that I'm going to come to you with, Tim. Um, you said, <clears> I think, <throat> that it was really bands in town inclined people, people that are already going to live shows that were self-serving into the live streaming space. Tim, I'm going to ask you both sides of that question, creator and consumer. How are creators learning about your platform? Why has it been so attractive? How have you been able to build that community of what many people might consider to be little or unknown artists that have created this huge volume of, of, of interest for you? It's capitalism. <laughs> What's happening pretty simply is artists are starting to make money. And uh, the bulk of our artists are not well known. Um, and and I've been having been a musician myself when artists find ways to make money word spreads pretty quickly. So we certainly have done a fair bit of outreach um, and continue to do that and all over the world. But um, what's happening is artists are starting from humble means in their homes. You know, these are m m often just aspiring musicians that have never played professionally and they start playing and between the gamification and the growth engine, they start earning something approaching a living wage from this live streaming. And, you know, it's, it's my strong belief that, uh, you know, there's an enormous volume of very talented musicians. I mean, Julian's company has been obviously has understood that for a long time, but there's a, a lot of artists that exist outside of the sort of commercial universe that just have no opportunity to, um, to be seen or heard. And there's a ton of talent out there. Um, and this is a platform that requires very little to get access, you know, a decent webcam, a microphone and some talent and a willingness to really engage with fans. And, and then what happens is that as artists start to make money, uh, they tell each other, uh, more artists come on, they watch each other, they see what works and they very rapidly innovate. And what we're, we're just seeing kind of this, this, um, self evolving, um, 
sort of method of performance uh, growing and growing. So um, it's very exciting. I want to ask what level of moderation you need to do, but maybe it's early days yet to determine whether you have to apply any, I don't want to say filters, but how to, does the community moderate itself or do you have to look at the data and the analytics and kind of point us as consumers to shows that might interest us? Well, this, this is, we're relatively new, right? So the, the product's been, came out a year ago. We, we actually began working on this long before COVID was, was anywhere on the horizon. Um, but really in the last four or five months is when things have started to kind of inflect. Um, so a lot of these questions you have are kind of, are ch the answers to that are, is an evolving answer we'll um, as we in. speak. Um, uh, but we will certainly require moderation just like any platform today that has human beings on one end saying stuff freely. Um, and uh, as content grows, you know, we have 2,500 artists. I, I, I love the fact that Julian has so much volume of this. It's really encouraging to hear that. Um, uh, curation becomes a, an ever more important uh, capability. And that was, you know, I came from Pandora where we spent all of our time trying to figure out what song to play next. So I get that, that challenge. Um, but I think uh, these systems learn very quickly. Um, and to me, the, the sort of holy grail is um, when you come to sessions live, when you walk in, it's like walking into a festival and you have a bunch of stages, but the stages that are there when you walk in are the ones you really want to see. So you don't have to walk very far. Um, and that happens at scale, essentially. Claire, um, that was a great transition to what I was hoping you might be willing to talk about, which is a pretty exciting recent announcement from Drift about an upcoming event that you've got. And I wondered if you might even elaborate about what we can expect as consumers of, of the big show. Yeah, 100%. So obviously what's being referred to there is Drift has just announced uh, as the official partner for Glastonbury's first ever live stream, which is hugely exciting. Um, so we've announced about 10 artists so far um, with some special guests to still be announced later on uh, next month. Um, it will be a different format. I think I think it's really interesting to hear Tim and Julian speak because actually Drift is, uh, is on the other side of the spectrum of what uh, Tim and uh, Julian are doing with their companies, which is we actually do very few shows and we do them at a very, very high production level and a very costly production level to our pockets. And we focus kind of on the top end of the artist scale and not at all um, on the bottom for now. I mean, we'd love to actually find a way to make the level of our format and the quality control that we are kind of known for more attainable to a wider range of artists. And we're looking into that, uh, a solution for that actually as we speak. Right now, we're focusing on the, on the kind of high end scale because we, we pay for all the production and the marketing ourselves. Um, and so we really kind of, because we're putting out all of that money, we need to make sure that all of our shows obviously make money because the risk is all on us versus on the artist. Um, and it's interesting actually, because uh, I'll talk about Glastonbury in a second and how that fits in, but the word live stream ha in my, especially for my business and in my opinion is a bit of a dirty word. And, and, and I don't mean dirty in a negative way, but it's being used as such a catch all phrase. Oh gosh, sorry, that's my computer updating. Um, it's being used in such a catch all phrase that um, it actually talks about, you know, it's, it's that catch all phrase for anyone as Tim has mentioned, in their living, well, in their bedroom with a webcam and a half decent mic to kind of five, five camera, like uh, really expensive production that we put in with, you know, anything from five to six figures in, in kind of production marketing costs altogether. That all is a live stream. And I think it's quite interesting when we're speaking to each other and hearing other people's perspective as to how we're all using that casual phrase and how that's being marketed and Kind of distributed to the fans so that you don't always know exactly what you're getting or what to expect when you're buying this new format that's being created so i think it's that's an interesting topic for today to kind of figure out you know it, it, ideally as a marketing person i would love for our shows to be called as a you know referred to as a drift but i if i say that right now everyone's going to be like what the hell is i talking about so we don't but i think this this kind of industry that's now being called live streaming and like this whole format is actually like several formats in one 
Uh, and I think it's it's a mistake to say that we're all doing the same thing. I think we're all working within the same space. But for example, at Drift, we're not a platform as such. So you wouldn't go to Drift to, and then see a whole bunch of shows and be like, oh, which one I want to do? Do I want to do right now? We're, we're set up quite differently in terms of how we produce and promote and market and kind of work more on the artist specific marketing plan and work within their overall um, ecosystem and what they're trying to achieve across their whole business and how the show fits into that. So it's a slightly different approach. Um, in terms of Glastonbury, um, it's going to be a five hour extravaganza, says the marketing person in me. And it's going to be different from um, doing a festival online as in you wouldn't be choosing which stage you want to watch. We will be doing the curation and the story building for the user at home um, using a variety of artists playing kind of back to back with poetry in between and all cinematically created and stitched together in a really beautiful way. So it will be very filmic in, in, its, in its essence. Uh, we're really excited about it, obviously. Um, and it will be a way for kind of the whole world to have Glastonbury experience, not Glastonbury, but a Glastonbury experience at home. Um, so obviously that's, that's a kind of a one-off, hugely exciting new prospect. So that's kind of how that ties together. Listening to you describe the drift approach makes me excited because between the three of you, you've now described a massive breadth of choice for consumers, right? What's really interesting is in these early days, the market already presents something for everyone, at, at least in terms of, I think, the types of experiences, and then everybody gets to choose what their particular value is that they want to get involved with. I take your point, too, about the words matter. Um, as a technology company, we sit here and, in fact, we, we didn't use the word live streaming when we launched ours. It was about real-time audio preparation as opposed to doing something that was done in batches so that people could think about it for OTT broadcasting or simulcasting or live shows. Or, in fact, it was the TV companies and the content companies that were doing OTT work that were much more interested early on with what MQA was doing than live concert promoters. At the time, concert promoters couldn't envision still a world outside of the arena or the venue. And yet the video centered industries saw the opportunity to improve audio quality within video experiences. So we kind of backed into real time live video experiences because of the opportunity to upgrade the audio. And then the music industry arrived, I think a little bit later to that point. But um, I, wanna, I wanna build on what you've also implied here about the experiences. And I'm gonna come to you, Julian. Um, given you both have Bands in Town Plus and Bands in Town as a, as a directory sitting over almost every one of the experiences, what can you tell us about what differentiates a show or maybe some of the consumer buying values that you're seeing? What would point somebody to a good experience? And, and do you have visibility to feedback where people are saying, ah, that wasn't really quite worth it or quite what I expected? How do you see that in the Bands in Town ecosystem? Well, I think Claire is right. It's all over the place. <laughs> but I think both uh, is com confusing. Uh, I think both for the fan, but also for the artist, because when an artist, you know, um, uh, decide to go or wants to do a, a live stream, then the question is, what do I do? Uh, uh, do I do, uh, you know, uh, a acoustic session, uh, you know, from my living room, uh, even though I'm from a big band or do I do a big production? And surprisingly for the fans, some are, you know, extremely satisfied with a very simple show or their favorite artist. Actually, that's what they're looking for because they've been to big concerts and they've seen this artist before, but not uh, in, an, in a, um, a more intimate sort of you know context. So it's it's really all over the place. I think I don't think there is like a, a, a magic recipe. Uh, you will see some big shows uh, like. You know, Claire is doing extremely successful. And then we've seen some very low production shows also very successful. So I, I, I don't know. I think it really depends on the artist. Um, I think that the fan would be happy to pay uh, for both. Uh, uh, and uh, I think the challenge also is to help the artist um, really figure, out, figure it out or figure out how to uh, approach that new format. What we've done with Plus is actually maybe to find a... Uh, uh, a third way is, you know, if you don't know, then you can come to us and we'll we'll do everything. We even pay you, so you don't have to actually uh, 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 sell tickets. Uh, we have a number of people that actually pay us every month to access a number of shows we curate and we actually produce. All the shows we do are produced. We have a, our own format. 
which is you know 45 minutes uh, um, um, uh, of music and 15 minutes of Q and A. Uh, questions are in real and in, in live. Uh, questions are asked by the fans through the chat, and then artists are answering the questions. This is the format, and that's what we do, you know, uh, every week. And that may be a good way for some artists to start, you know, live streaming if they haven't done that yet, and then obviously uh, do it on on their own. So I don't think there's a, a magic recipe. I think that um, if you if you find what works for fans, keep doing it. Uh, I think they will come back. Uh, as an artist, uh, um, I think maybe Tim can talk about it, but I'm sure there is the artist uh, uh, using sessions that, that do it on a regular basis, and that's successful. Uh, so it, it really depends on the artist and on the fan base, but it's, it's quite open, I think. Tim, I want to talk with you a little bit more about Claire's point of of precision of our words and how to describe it. You you've got a little bit of experience. Um, pulling the music industry, kicking and screaming into new experiences in your life. And I wonder if part of the challenge has been people are too quick to make this an apples to apples comparison to being in an arena with 20,000 other people. What guidance could you give to the industry to think about this differently or, or how to describe it to consumers so we don't get stuck in a comping mo model, but we really see this as a prop opportunity for innovation and growth? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Oftentimes, words that are, are used as shortcuts, and because it's a quick way to sort of give some, uh, somebody a, an idea of what you're doing. Um, and so live streaming has, has come to encompass a lot of things, uh, for sure. And I think uh, Claire's right that there are, there are within that de description, there are things that are, you know, very different one from the other. Um, well, I'll answer your question in a second. Let me let me say that have, thoughts were going through my head as as Julian and Claire were speaking. Is I think that regardless of whether you're somebody on on your bed with an acoustic guitar and a sure 57 microphone, you know, and a webcam, or you're um, I've seen some of the dress stuff that's really super high quality, you know, beautiful um, uh, events. I think that there are two. Um, underlying capabilities that have to be there for any of these things to succeed. Uh, one of them is a really good form of monetization, of course. So like, what is the mechanism for monetization? What is the value prop? And, 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 and how do you get somebody to part with money for them? Like a beautiful show is not worth it, uh, anything if you can't get people to pay for it. And, you know, people can pay, play from their bedrooms all day long, but they'll stop if no one's paying for them, you know, or unless they just want to do it for fun. Um, and, and the other one is exposure, getting people to come. And uh, a lot of these events have been like trees falling in the forest. You know, I'd, I'd say that live streaming writ large, I'd say has been characterized by low audience attendance. And I include some of these giant artists in that, right? I mean, there are global superstars that pull 30,000 people to an event that was global. And it, people call it a success. And I go, what? 30,000 people, that's a big problem. Yeah. I think what's happening is live streaming has not been a growth category. It's been an exploitation category. So artists come to it with an existing audience and a mailing list and a social network and whatnot. And they do an event. They do largely free organic marketing and they peel off some small percentage and convert them to viewers. And they can do that a few times and then it runs out of gas. That's not really changing anything. Um, and there will always be the sort of feast or famine, you know, established artists that have the fan base, they'll make money here and everybody else won't. So to me, like really the hard question here is how you solve for those, you know, how can you build a system where you can afford to spend money to market someone who doesn't have a fan base, you know? Um, and, you know, in the case of bands in town, I think they're, they're leaning on an existing audience from their product that's been around for, I don't know, uh, Julian, 10, 15 years um, and using that scale. And I think Claire is using quality times artist uh, visibility to solve that problem. I I'm really focused on like these thousands of artists, tens of thousands of artists that no one will ever back ever. Like how do they get someone to show up? Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is a big jumble of things of modality, monetization, mechanisms, all under one giant umbrella, and they're not the same thing. That's absolutely right. And it's messy. And, you know, frankly, 
the music industry, the label side doesn't care about this stuff. They don't get paid for live music in general. It's not been a big successful category. It's not a content focused thing. So labels haven't been focused on it. Um, I think artists have to believe that this is something that is important, will make money and is enduring. I think labels actually strangely have been uh, interested in it from what we've seen, but they've uh, they've messed it up a lot of the times when they've done it. <laughs> they a, it uh, so there's been quite, and, and I mean, I speak, I come from the label side, so I speak that with all due respect, but I think they had a go and have, you know, I know some, some labels have run their own and then the, it's interesting what you say. I, I mean, I, I think 30,000 is not a bad number for a new format where we're still trying to establish it. It depends on how much you spend. And I think the idea is you need to understand that the artist needs to make money um, and um, it, it, the forecast needs to be right, right? So when we look at whatever artists, we look at a very strong, we've got quite a long forecasting um, tool. We work out how many we think we can sell. It's now having done a few shows, we get the pretty close to it. And then we decide the production and marketing that so that so that it's a sustainable model and everyone can do it. So I think it really depends on the size of the artist, how much you're spending and the format that you're offering. Um, in terms of where the labels come in and how this fits into the wider, um, the wider idea for, you know, an artist campaign and kind of the whole kind of touring life, uh, touring life, live, and obviously touring is gonna come back um, music album touring and all of that the way it all fits together is really interesting because so a lot of the labels at the start were trying to do it themselves had a go didn't really work out not so interested in it anymore uh, but they have become very interested in working with us and i'm sure with all of you as well in terms of how do we integrate that as part of the campaign and what we found there and, and to how you reach the audience and how you convert it into a cell is quite interesting and in fact in that's where they made a mistake is that the way that this is communicated both in terms of the words you use and the visuals but also just in terms of cadence and how you present and, and what timing you presented it's really important that it doesn't feel like an album promo uh, event because album promo events which labels are brilliant at my background you never pay for right it's the it's the user expectation is you do not pay for that so when you start presenting something that feels like uh, an album promo and then you go oh and then you have to pay for it people are like what's going on here so that's what we learn quite quickly that the wording you use how it's kind of packaged into an album you know, even the title of the event all of that it's really important that it has its own life it has its own visual identity um, so since I came on kind of two months into the business, I felt really strongly as a marketing person that the visuals we would use and the, the stuff we would use to promote it would be shot front by ourselves uh, and not use the catch-all, let's use the same press photo that all fans have seen 1700 times to stick it on that. And then that's also the tour, you know, the, the poster. And then let's use an old music video that everyone's seen a hundred times and put some text over it and then say that's a live show. So really kind of building its own moment, its own visual look and, and really setting the expectation as close as you can right for the fans. So they're like, okay, this is exactly what I'm paying for. This is what I can expect. This is the quality, this is the narrative. This is kind of this, the, 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 the set. I think that really, really, really helps. And then off the back of that, now that we've kind of figured out how to do it, we can then work with the label and actually help them sell quite a lot of um, albums themselves. So we bundled into our tickets and I'm sure you guys will talk about this and I'm sure your merch offering is also really good. But we find that, you know, once you've got people ready to make a transaction, adding additional things such as merch and album bundles have been very successful for us. And that helps, again, help with, you know, what what Tim is trying to do, which is just build more money for artists that have been struggling in a, in a tricky period. Um, yeah. so, so I think that there's a lot there, but it's, it's really about thinking about it as its own format and giving it its own moment and not comparing it to a live show because it's not, it's a different format. It's not an album promo. It's this new thing that just like how, you know, at the beginning when we were trying to get people the head around investing money into social content they were like what is this this is not a music video this is what i'm supposed to what i'm supposed to entertain my yeah. fans you know so it's just a new format and people have to get their head around it and people use a habit have to get their head around it and paying for it has to get people have to get their head around it and how they 
get the show to the TV, by the way, is a whole question that we have to answer every day of our lives for the next probably forever, um, especially when you're dealing with like an Andrea Pacelli show where you've got a certain demographic. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot there that we're exploring all together. And I think it's exciting that we're all kind of going at it from different angles. And for us, you know, we're, we're super new, like we're kind of, we've always said we, we're really like platform neutral, ticketing partner neutral. And, we encourage everybody in, we want this this format to win. And I think for it to win, we all have to work really collaboratively together and all specialize in what we're really good at and then create this format for it to stay and for it to be sustainable. And that's kind of looking at what each person's USP is and working with the, the best that they can bring so we can reach all these fans and create the user habit before it's too late as such. And um, because I think we've got kind of a really good opportunity right now with people kind of warming up to the format and understanding the value that there could be there. So I there are that's... such different products in here. Like we have an artist, any artist, one woman from Romania, pianist, she plays several hours a week, a week, and she's making over a hundred thousand dollars a year. That's just a different product. Like, totally. Uh, yeah, product. Product. <laughs> it's, it's, it's similar to being a YouTuber, right? Or like, a, a, what's mm -hmm. the other one? Um, Patreon. It's it's kind of, you've done a different format of, of, mm -hmm. of a UGC kind of um, format that has existed, but has come into a slightly different thing. As you say, it's a completely different format. It's a different product. Tim, I wonder too, if, if and dusting off my past lives of, of overseeing an artist development group at Warner, we always encourage artists to develop their social profile. Do you find that's helpful for the emerging artists on your platform that they can at least plug into their social footprint, even if it's small and amplify it and then start to use the power of your platform to grow it maybe to another level? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, that is definitely right. Although what uh, I think a, um, a truth that musicians are discovering now, an unpleasant truth, is that you can't actually reach your own fans on your social networks without paying a lot of money. You know, an organic post on Instagram, which is four or 5% of your followers on average. And if you wanna reach the rest, you gotta pay. And so there's this terrible reality that musicians face right now. They spent the last 10, 15, 20 years building up their social audience with the idea that this would become my audience that I can talk to. And turns out there's a giant toll booth between them and that audience. And so musicians, when COVID hit and the physical world shut down, they literally were stranded. I mean, they went to the computer thinking, okay, no problem. I can't go to play the local club, but I'll just go online and use these things online. But the truth is they can, no one can hear them because those sites make money by paying, causing people to pay to reach their audience. So um, I actually think the, for that reason, a social audience is not nearly as potent as musicians thought it was. Um, and I think that's a problem that if they don't fix, if the industry doesn't actually address gradually, all the value of this industry will shrink into Facebook and Instagram because they're just, you know, they're just taking that, they're, they're, they're monetizing it. They're making all the money, all this content on those sites and those sites are making the money, not the artists and labels. I, I mean, I slightly disagree with that, uh, throwing that spanner in the works. I mean, I was the head of digital at Island Records. I've been, you know, fighting a long fight with these so social media platforms as well, a long friendly fight where we're helping <laughs> hurt each other in, in different terms. And, and I think, yes, if you look at it from, if we all were foolish enough to think that a huge big company was just giving us a whole bunch of free re reach and building their business, their you know billion dollar business on that, then it, yes, it would be foolish to think that you can reach these people for free. However, putting that aside, I think it's really important to say that um, digital advertising is one of the most uh, exciting thing for an artist because it's so efficient. And we have found that our advertising uh, strategy, which we do in house, has been revolutionary now that we actually have a ticket to sell versus a streaming, which you can't track. So we've had incredible results uh, with our ability to sell the tickets through advertising, especially in the last three months, we've really cracked the code on it. Um, and if we look at it apart from the way it's been sold, which is this is a free way to talk to your fans, which I agree with you, Tim, it's not. It is probably the most powerful uh, advertising strategy for people to do. However, they are going to need to put money in to get it out. But with selling a ticket, it's very easy because you see exactly how much money you're making. So, you know, if you're selling a ticket for 15 pounds and you can sell it through advertising for two pounds of ad spend, 
that's incredibly powerful um, for an artist to see because you get that whole, you know, that's your RI, you just spend until your RI is not positive anymore. And that's really great in terms of enabling that because before you were putting ads up, you were hoping they were, you do that, you, you know, it, there was no transparency. So I agree, you, it, it's foolish to think that you can reach these people and talk to them directly. But it's a different opportunity. I think it's a different way of spinning that, which is it's an opportunity to think about of a really good way of investing money into reaching more people in a super transparent way. And with a ticket that you can track and you can do checkout, it's actually brilliant. Um, however, yes, uh, you know, mailing lists, I've been screaming about mailing lists for as far as I could ever scream to people to not forget about them and, and like continue to invest in them. But the more people you have on your social media, the more efficient your advertising is as well. So dear artists who've worked your ass off to gain followers, don't cry. It's not all terrible. It's not great, but it's not terrible either. I always think we should caution that. I'm going to well, now take us down in an unfair path and I'm going to come to you, Julian, which is we have five minutes left to talk about things that should probably get two to three hours each. So it's going to be a bit of a speed round here. And I just wanted to talk for a second about where remote consumption of content, I'm not going to use the aforementioned <clears throat> term, the remote consumption experience presents very positive attributes for sustainability and accessibility. Either humans that can't make it to a particular singular place and certainly in environmental considerations. And I wonder, Julian, if you could speak from your perspective about how that sits within the values of let's call it traditional live music fans. And do you think that's an attribute that we should be promoting more to get people to understand how powerful these experiences can be and how responsible they are to make sure that they're healthy and diverse? Yeah, I think that uh, that uh, it's, a, it's a unique opportunity for artists to increase their uh, revenue stream, uh, especially uh, uh, probably as Tim said, the smaller, smaller bands. Uh, <clears throat> and on the, on the consumer side, uh, I think that there is a huge opportunity at um, uh, educating the fan in uh, thinking that they have a place to go, you know, uh, or a number of hours to spend per week on that new uh, 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 medium. Uh, whether, as Claire said, you know, stream on TV, which I think is going to be the next big thing, is watch your, this on TV. It's not that easy. Uh, 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 or, you know, uh, uh, maybe on on your on your mobile device to to check out your band that you just heard of. But I, I think that there is there is a good opportunity. We have to educate uh, uh, both the artist and uh, and the fan. This is new. Uh, two years ago, nobody was watching a, a live music really a live music show, and no artist was really streaming a show. Actually, it was so expensive to do it that nobody was doing it. It's only one year old. Uh, we said what eighty thousand shows already uh, streamed online so i think we're it's a good start but we need to 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 make it successful we need the artist to make money and we need the fan to be uh, to be happy so definitely more interaction and in new formats and tim and claire either of you or both of you can maybe chime in your thoughts on those same topics which is the the positive attributes associated with sustainability and accessibility and i guess the overall flexibility um that comes with the ability to experience music remotely. What What are your thoughts on that before we wrap up? Tim? Well, you don't get mud on you, right? At Glastonbury, so clear <laughs> up good. Um, uh, I, think, I think that uh, for this to really thrive, I think artists need to see this as an interactive experience. Um, that is, I think, where the long-term, at least one part of this live stream thing there's a there's a healthy opportunity but you i don't think you could view this as a broadcast i think that uh artists can really thrive if they and we're, we're i'm saying this from experience now we've got thousands of artists that are doing this and it's works but but what works is engaging and actually seeing this as not a one-way experience um and if you do that and do that well and you uh, establish uh, consistency and you're good at what you do there's a there's a lot of opportunity yeah, I mean, for us, I think it's reaching those audiences you never could. So with Niall, Haran, we sold 125,000 tickets, which is obviously a huge amount, but also in 127 countries. Um, you couldn't imagine Niall going to more than, you know, 20 countries on a big tour. 
Um, so I think the accessibility for a massive audience like that to actually reach all of, really reach their whole global audience in one night is pretty electrifying. And, um, you know, the chat on socials and everything after and during is, is pretty amazing. So I think for us, that's really, truly so super serving all your fans across the world. And that's really, really exciting. And, and also for people who, you know, have kids who couldn't go to a show. We see a lot of that. People who couldn't afford the ticket because obviously the ticket price is, is, is reduced. Um, we see a lot of social chatter about people saying, we hope this stays around after it because this is a way for me to experience an artist that I couldn't ever go to physically or financially or time-wise. It lifts a lot of restrictions. So I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of opportunities there. By the way, these grassroots, just to be clear, these grassroots deals, we had artists who just made $350,000 in an hour. So like, there's large amounts of money here. It's not just for a starter artist. If you get the formula right, these can be very, very lucrative. Well, I wanted to say I'm very grateful for the three of you joining and uh, providing such thoughtful input as everybody's working through it. Um, Paul, I'm going to turn this thing back over to you, I believe, if you want to come back into the group. Let's see if he's there. There he is. I just want to thank everybody for uh, what a fantastic panel. Thank, uh, thanks to all. Of, I'm so glad we got this lineup. Actually, I think it's a really good, uh, good mixture, and exactly what I wanted. And of course, expertly handled by by you, Mike. So, thanks everybody. Um, and uh, actually, just just to one one last thing, maybe just to ask you, you know, any specific tips for for Japanese artists, and maybe you know, in terms of using your platforms that you might uh, want to uh, just point towards the audience? I can offer one thing, which is, um, you know, one advantage that East Asian uh, societies have around this is they've got a well-established culture of tipping and uh, patronage. You know, they're far ahead of the Western countries. And so uh, marrying that established uh, uh, ha habit with this, it, it happens much faster. And we've seen that as well. So um, for artists, this is definitely something to think hard about doing. Um, <clears throat> for Japan specifically, uh, by the way, the market has been extremely active, late to start, but very active in, uh, uh, you know, um, organizing paid uh, uh, concerts online uh, the past six months. Uh, the one thing to, to keep in mind is to really think about the long term and creating uh, a, a rendezvous for people to come back and not think uh, live stream as a, as a typical uh, um, uh, uh, concert show, uh, you know, road show where I do the same concert or similar concert, you know, every two weeks. That doesn't really work. So I think that in Japan, they have to think about creating something of a... a um, uh, a place where people or fan meets and meet them, uh, you know, on a regular basis. Um, and f I mean, from my side, I don't have any um, kind of territory specific tips, but just kind of the same as I think I've said, um, we, we do sell tickets in Japan. We'd love to sell more. So if there was ever a Japanese artist that wanted to try something, we'd be very open to exploring that. We'd love to um, do more in Asia. Actually, we've got partners there, but we haven't quite done the local um, artists from the region. So yeah, looking forward to that in the future. In many ways, I think uh, Japan is about to become a fascinating laboratory for this topic with the Olympics upon us. The, uh, we have so much that we can learn, I think, from sport generally about how to reach fans remotely. And if we are able to get music experiences attached to some of the Olympic behavior that we're gonna see, it may be one of the more exciting ones, especially when you when you combine it with the, the cultural behaviors that Tim's already pointed to. Thanks again to everyone. Uh, really great listening to your thoughts, and I hope we get to do this again. Thanks, Thank everyone. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.